Good morning. It's glad to see everyone here this morning. I appreciate the uh, object lesson. Uh, that was good. Uh, my family has an, a special affinity for that type of chocolate. Uh, I do appreciate that. So, um, This morning, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 12. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 12. We'll be starting in verse 22. And this portion of Scripture that I'm going to share with you this morning contains some things that you're going to probably find familiar to you. Uh, as I was driving home from Kaysen's football practice on Thursday, I tuned in, and I'm so thankful that we have the technology today to be able to tune in when we're not able to be here in person, but to listen to Brother Scott Reiner's sermon. And as I listened to him read his scripture from Matthew 6, I was amazed that the Holy Spirit had led him to that scripture and had led me to the parallel scripture here in Luke chapter 12. As I listened, initially I said, well, I may need to find something different. But as I continued to listen to his message, I, I realized that this message will couple very nice with his toward the end, and it will meet up nicely, and you'll see. This is a subject area we're going to talk about this morning that I personally struggle with. I felt led to share this with you this morning. The scripture, we're going to find Jesus... He's going to be sharing and teaching with a group of people that includes his disciples. He is on uh, the mount, and he is giving the sermon on the mount. So let us read. Verse 22, And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat. And the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is the least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God so clothe the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? Seek not what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye doubtful in mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. May we go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this time that we can come we can read your scripture, Father, and, and, and ponder the things that you have laid out for us. And as we study this passage, Father, I just pray that you will uh, give us listening ears. And Father, I just pray that uh, you will speak through me and, and, and provide the discernment for all of us as we rightly divide the word of truth. Be with us. Be with Brother Randy as he is on the road of travel. Lord, just watch over us. Forgive us when we do fall short. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we look at this passage together, I want to draw your attention to uh, uh, something that Jesus says essentially three times. And he says it in verse 22. He's telling us to do not be anxious. And, and then in verse 29, he's telling us don't keep worrying. And then in 32... He tells us, do not be afraid. So the title of this message is Worry-Free Living. The Lord Jesus in Scripture at least 12 times is recorded to have said, don't worry or don't be anxious. And, and, and there are often times he says, don't be afraid. But every time he goes on to explain why. And that's what we're going to look at today. 
Anxiety-free living is part of what the Lord offers to us. It's part of the gospel message. And I've met with Brother Randy a couple of times, um, sometimes preparing a message or a Bible study lesson. And, and on those times, I always tell him, when I begin to work on a message or a lesson, it always ministers to me and points things out in my life more than I could ever hope to, to minister to anyone else. This message is no different. I have what is sometimes called a type A personality. Um, I confess, I'm a worrier. I lose sleep sometimes because of it. Um, I struggle with that. I understand. The world we live in is stressed out. I get it. We, we, we see that people are anxious around us, and I understand why. I understand why they worry. It's just kind of frightening to us to kind of be in the world and not knowing what's going to happen next. As we look at the climate of our society right now, there's a lot of worry. We're right on the cusp of probably the most important election in all of our lifetime. We are, we are at the precipice. And there's a lot of worry and fear. And I see it. Uh, through people's actions. But I have a message of hope for us. It's a message of understanding for us. When you look around, we, we really do live in an anxiety-ridden culture, but what's amazing to me is that our culture enjoys one of the highest standards of living in the history of the world. But yet, we are the most worried, anxious, stressed-out societies in the history of the world. We even have a massive medical world that exists to do nothing but to help people with stress. And, and really, it's a real problem with many people. Anxiety is. They live with worry and stress. It's so common that, that they don't even talk about eliminating stress. The, the term for our society is to manage it. You can take a course or to a seminar... You can listen to a lecture or, or, or even buy a tape on stress management. But the goal of our society is to live with managed anxiety. And, and again, it gets pretty serious with, with many people, all in the name of managing the stress. But Jesus here comes along and, and he says, I'm, I'm not going to teach you how to manage your stress. I'll eliminate it. You know, the best the world can offer you is to manage your anxiety. Jesus is offering to eliminate it. That sounds like a good deal to me. And just to get rid of it altogether, just to stop it. And, and many times in those late hours that I'm up thinking or, or let's just say worrying about it, sometimes I get just this feeling that it'll be okay. I, I truly believe that is the Spirit calming us, calming me. Our compassionate God is offering a far better solution than what the world is. It's the elimination of stress and anxiety. I wanted to start this academically. As you know, I enjoy looking at words and the meanings of them. I want to look at the word worry. The word worry. It's been defined as a thin stream of fear trickling through the mind. But if it's encouraged, this fear, if it's encouraged, it'll cut a channel to where all other thoughts are drained. You, you, you may start with just a little bit of worry, but eventually it can engulf your whole life and your whole mind. You know, I read an article the other day, and it said that a dense fog covering seven city blocks and a hundred feet deep is actually composed of less than one glass of water. It's just divided into 60 billion little droplets. There's not much water there in a big fog, but it can cripple an entire community. And that's what happens with us and with worry. You know, we have something maybe the size of this glass of water right here. It can cripple 
our whole life. You know, when you look at worry, it actually comes from an old German word, worgen. It means to choke or to strangle. And what it's talking about is mental strangulation through fear, anxiety, stress, and worry. You know, when you think about people's worries also, they can usually fit into just two categories, material or spiritual. In verse 22, to that, he tells us, don't be anxious for your life. And by that he means what you eat, your body, what you wear. He says, stop worrying about that, the basics of life. And then down in verse 32, he tells us, Don't be afraid on the spiritual level, for your Father has gladly given you the kingdom of, of heaven. So you're left with no category to worry about, essentially. And, and so we can conclude, just looking at what Jesus is saying here, that if you do worry as a Christian, it's a sin. It is. But it's a sin that rises from a failure to understand God. It's a failure to understand His sovereign love, His care, and His resources. And so that's what Jesus unfolds here. Jesus here is offering anxiety-free living. And, and when you realize that you come into His kingdom, that God takes care of you. Your worry is, is really, the, it has ended. What's defined your life for so long has now been eliminated. Now as we move forward in this message, there are some, some promises of God that we need to understand. And understanding of these promises help us to eliminate this worry and these stress, these stresses. In the verses as they unfold all the way down to 32, there's going to be several points that I want to uh, draw your attention to. There's three points to be exact. And they show that worry arises from a failure to understand something about God. And by identifying these three, it should, should help us to deal with our stress. And to help you, I'm, I'm a high school teacher, and to help my kids remember something, I always try to make a mnemonic device. So our three points are all going to begin with the letter P. Help us remember. That's handy, right? The first one. Let's look that worry is a failure to understand divine priority. So the first P would be priority. Let's go back to 22. He said to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, do not be anxious for your life as to what you shall eat, nor for your body as to what you shall put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. That's really not hard to understand there, just on the surface. But there's some things below the surface that I think if we dig in a little bit, it'll help us with a, a deeper understanding here. He says to his disciples, for this reason. So, so there's been an interruption somewhere. And I want to glance up to verse 13. If you remember, a man has interrupted Jesus. And, and by telling him, he ought to say to his brother, give me my share of the inheritance. And then Jesus goes on this wonderful parable of the rich man who built bigger and bigger barns to keep everything for himself. But then the Lord tells him, Tonight your life will be required of you. And then Jesus says, you know, at the, the last part of that, you should lay up treasure in heaven. You should be rich toward God, not selfish. And that's how it ends in verse 21. And so after answering this young man's plea with a parable, he resumes his teaching and he connects the two together. In verse 22, For this reason I say, do, do not be anxious. For what reason? Well, the reason he just stated in verse 21. It's your priorities. It's your focus of your life. We have a choice to make in our life as to whether we lay up treasure for yourself 
or we're rich towards God. It's about a heart focus. And this isn't talking necessarily about salvation here. There are many Christians who still get priorities out of order. I'm included. That's why I worry. I tend to put things above where they should be, and sometimes in front of God. And that's a sin. But Jesus is telling this man, you're either selfish and materialistic and focus on keeping everything, or you lay up your treasure in heaven. That's, that's the choice of priorities we have to make in our own life. And so in the spiritual realm. You're, you're either serve God or you serve money. You're either rich toward God or you indulge yourself. And that's the point he makes. And, and you may be raising questions yourself. This obviously raises questions for the people listening to him. Definitely. I mean, they, they, they're asking, well, if we give everything to God, well, what, what's in it for me? I mean, is it, what's going to happen to us? Who's going to take care of us? It's a, it's a dog-eat-dog world out there, right? I mean, if I don't build bigger barns and take care of myself and, and put that first and, and stockpile, who, who's going to take care of me? And I, I really don't want anyone else to take care of me. I don't want to have to depend on anyone else. And, and all these questions are natural questions and feelings for us. The answer of, to all these questions, the Lord gives us here. God's going to take care of you. When our focus is on the material world over God, we got our priorities backwards. And to illustrate this, Jesus tells us that God is the one who feeds the birds. God is the one who feeds in the field. God is the one who knows what you need. God is the one who will give you the kingdom. So, so what, what if God one day asks you to give up everything just like he did that rich young ruler? Just sell everything and give all your money to the poor. What if he did? Would you be like that rich young ruler who just turned away and, and, and walks off? The rich young ruler, he wanted his money more than he wanted to depend on God. But on the other hand... Jesus tell, says in Luke 9, 23, that if you want to come after me, you have to deny yourself. You have to lose your life. If you follow Jesus, it very well may cost you everything. It cost the apostles everything. They, they dropped their nets and their livelihood. They dropped everything. And they followed him. No, I don't want you to misunderstand. What Jesus is asking here is how desperate are you for God? That's what he's asking. How much do you want to be the, in the kingdom? If all you're focused on is material possessions, money, then according to the parable of the soils, what's going to happen when that seed, it'll go in, and there's going to be a little bit of reaction and response. But then the love of riches and the deceitfulness of riches are going to choke out that seed. Choke out that life. In other words, people who are truly called and have it truly experienced Christ, they're going to say, look, I don't, I don't care what it costs me. I don't care what it costs me. If you have everything... I'll give it whatever it is. I'll give it. If you can, please look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. As you turn there, I, I really do love the attitude of the Apostle Paul. He's another one that gave up everything to follow God. Philippians 4, verse 11. He tells us, I've learned to be content 
in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I know how to live in prosperity. In every and any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and of going hungry. Of abundance and suffering. What's, what is the secret he shares with us? It is trusting God. The Apostle Paul, he has experienced some of everything. And he says the secret to it all is trusting God. Sometimes you have a lot. Sometimes you just have a little. But you've always got enough. That's the answer to our worries. I want to go back to our original text in Luke. Jesus is going to explain further. He says, do not be anxious for your life. Now, what do you mean life? Well, that's your physical life. He explains it. He, he, he's meaning what you shall eat. Don't be anxious about your body, what you're going to wear. And now, I want you to put yourself in these, the time period of when he's sharing this. This would be deeply concerning for people in the day of Jesus. I mean, they're basically, they're living to survive. There, there's no Walmart. There's no fast food places. You know, there's no place for you to go buy clothing that, that are available to us. Back then, if you wanted to eat, you went and caught it or, or picked it and grew it and grinded it out yourself. You cooked it. You did all the preparation for it. And if you wanted clothing from somewhere, you went and bought the thread or you went and bought the fabric. You, you made it on a loom. You made the garment. And if you were poor, that's a real struggle in that time period. You're, you're basically, everything about your life was about getting food and clothing. It, it was a serious thing. And, and Jesus is telling them here, don't worry about that. You know, I mean, their life, it was about getting meals each day to survive and, and clothes to stay warm or protected from the blazing heat of the sun. But he says, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you're going to eat to support your life. Don't worry about your body, what you're going to put on. Look at verse 23, for life is more than food and the body than clothing. Say that. You exist for a higher reason, okay? You do. You exist for a higher calling. Life is more than food, and you have a body for more reasons than just clothing. In, in other words, God is, it didn't make you just so you can be like some other animal. You're more than that. I've had the opportunity when I was in high school to show a few cows. My father-in-law raises cows. I enjoy looking at cows and, and being around them. But when you think about it, they're eating machines, aren't they? I mean, that's, that's what they do. They eat, and they eat, and they eat a lot more, all for the purpose to provide us with products. That's what they do. We are more than just animals. We are, are not just the ultimate end of the food chain, which unfortunately is a popular view today in our culture. We are not some final product of evolution. Your, your body was designed as something that is not just supposed to be clothed for environmental protection. You're not a mannequin. It's not really about all that. So we got that clear. We're not just eating machines or mannequin. It's pretty clear. But you know, it's hard to convince our culture of that. Food and fashion. Food and fashion. There's entire magazines and, and television series that are dedicated to food and, food and fashion. But you know, if, if you're without God, not called of His and not in the kingdom, essentially that's what you equate to as an eating machine and a mannequin. You're not making any inroads toward the kingdom. But God didn't give the life to His people for that reason. And, and, and I'm not here just to exist. It is in God that I live and move and have my being, but God has a purpose for our life. I am under a divine priority. 
The simple idea is this. For those of you who are in the kingdom, if God gave you life, and he did, if he wants you to live, and he does, because you're sitting here still alive, if he brought you into his kingdom, and he has, he has a purpose for you to fulfill in his kingdom, to his glory. He's going to sustain you in that fulfillment. I mean, it wouldn't make sense, would it, if God told us, you know, I'm going to save you. I'll give you eternal life. I'll, I'll give you a spiritual life and a purpose for your life and a destiny and a, and a plan and a purpose. I've even gifted you. I've called you. I've laid out circumstances for you. But man, if you can just keep yourself alive just to fill this deal out, that'd be great. That doesn't make much sense. That's silly. In all honesty, the people who are not in God's family, they just tend to come and go and live and die, and they, they just don't make a contribution to the divine kingdom. But those of us who are called and are His, we're fulfilling His divine purpose. So that when you are called, you can say with the psalmist, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me through the valley of the shadow of death and out the other side. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the psalmist says. So again, just to review point one, God has given you life. He's redeemed you. God has a purpose for your life. He's going to provide what you need to survive. Be rich toward God, and you will have the promise that as you're rich toward God, He will be lavishly rich toward you. We shouldn't be over-focused on amassing more stuff. We've all been given gifts. We have. We are to use those gifts for the glory of God. And when taking care of yourself outweighs glorifying God... We're out of order. Jesus is, is teaching us here to be wise, be faithful. Don't be foolish. Be a good steward. You, you should do some planning for the future. But there's no need to hoard so that you can just survive in the future. You're going to be sustained by the Creator until His purpose for your life ends. He'll feed you till the very, very end. And what a blessing that is to know. Our second P, worry fails to understand divine provision. So the second P is provision. And I want you to look at verse 24. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. And they have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are, are you than the birds? When you think about birds, I think he, he picks birds here as his illustration for a reason. They, they're just sort of, I guess, the most fragile. They're, they're just kind of here, and then sometimes they're just kind of gone. And, and uh, they're a great illustration of divine provision when we actually look at that. Did you know that every crow that has ever lived, God wanted it to live? And for however long God wanted that bird to live, he provided its food. If, if God feeds the bird, the birds, only in some very modest way can that bird give back glory to God as any of his creation would. Don't you think that he's going to take care of making sure that you eat? You have the highest and noblest capacity to give him glory which is why we're here today. He's saying, look at the crows. They don't sow or reap, but you do. You're out working and, and you know, plowing and putting these seeds in and watering those seeds and coming along with back-breaking work of harvest. These crows don't even have a storeroom. They don't have a barn. They're incapable of, of generating their own food supply. 
They, they are absolutely, totally dependent on God. What's provided to them by the Creator is all they have. That's it. They don't have to have the ingenuity or capability to create their own food like we do. They only have the capability and instinct to pick up what's been provided to them. You know, I want, this brings to, to mind an illustration. My mother and I share a love of birds. That may be weird, but we do. We both have several bird feeders in our backyards. But my mom is really good at attracting them. She's good at it. And it's like an aviary in her backyard sometimes, and it's wonderful. I, I go and I look at the birds sometimes, but we both enjoy that part of God's creations. But when I look and watch those birds at the feeder, man, they are absolutely relentless, aren't they? They fight each other, those little bird feeders. They knock seed to the ground. They get on the ground. They fight each other on the ground. They chase each other around. They yak at each other over these seeds. They do. And when uh, the feeders are, go empty, what happens to the birds? They're gone. You don't see them anymore. You know, I, I don't know what happens to them. They'll be gone for as however long the, the feeder's empty, but within a day, my mom feel, fills up that feeder, and somehow the word gets out. One bird will come eat, and I guess he goes and tells all his buddies. And then they're back, dozens and dozens of them. Where do they go? They're there. We just don't see them. Those birds, when those feeders, my mom doesn't put feeders up, those birds are still provided the resources for their survival. They are. Now, I don't want anybody to misinterpret this section of Scripture to say that somebody doesn't need to plan for retirement, don't need to work. That's not what he's saying. You'd be missing the point there. He's addressing, again, our focus here. He's provided the resources for us. God has. He's provided our capability to work and to gain those things. But if we're ever in a situation where even in our best efforts that we can't provide enough, God will find a way to take care of those that are His. And it's amazing to see how he does that. We work and it's good, but remember, it is God who providentially provides. If you remember in Job chapter 38, verse 41, he tells us, he asks us, sorry, who prepares for the raven its nourishment when its young cries to God and wonder about without food? Well, the answer to that is God Almighty. If God didn't provide food, if God hadn't designed the food, food chain, the crows wouldn't survive. God wants them to survive. That's why they're here. God made the crows for His own glory. God feeds them in verse 24. And God has a purpose for their existence. There is manifest honor that comes to Him by feeding those crows. And there is a glory that comes to him through that. There's delight that comes to him through that. That God feeds them. And that is the same provision that he makes for us all. Look at the end of verse 24. How much more valuable are you than the birds? You know, if he sees to it that the birds have food, don't you think he's, he'll see to it that you do? You don't need to spend your whole life worrying about whether you're going to have enough. Have you ever thought about how much is enough? That word is tricky, isn't it? I have the pleasure to teach high school economics to a classroom full of seniors who will next year be in the great big world. And the first day of school, every, every time I have a new, new group, I present to them the principle of scarcity, the word scarcity. Scarcity is a human reaction to the knowledge that there is limited resources that we have available in the world. And I always start the discussion with how much is enough? It could be anything, food, money, clothes, cars. Did you know it usually starts an argument in that class? 
it does. Our human nature is so fickle sometimes. You know, if tomorrow we were all given a million dollars, by Tuesday we'd want two million. You know, we, in our small little minds, nothing is ever enough, is it? It never is. It's only through the understanding of God and His provision that you realize God provides for your needs. And He promises to sustain us to the end of His purpose. He actually promises us enough. It's, it's not always our definition of enough, but it is inconceivably enough. So if He gave you life, He'll sustain your life. And, and He will provide you all you need to continue to honor Him. And you know, as I thought about this lesson and I thought about it, it, providing food, I, I kind of pondered the food supply of, of the world. It, it, it amazes me. Our, our farming system, our agricultural system, I, I've grown up around it. It's just staggering the, the variety of food out there today is beyond belief. It's, it's a, a boundless, self-perpetuating, renewable food supply. And, and there is more than enough potential on this planet to provide food for itself. The earth is still filled with food and potential to make food, but God has created it like this for it to be boundless supply. He provides it for His faithful people. God is going to take care of His own children. So why worry about life's necessities? So just to review, number one, worrying is a failure to understand divine priority. The priority is that you're here as God's child to fulfill a divine purpose. And He's going to sustain you to the end. Secondly, worrying is a failure to understand divine provision. If he takes care of the animals who only in a nominal way give him the glory, how much more is he going to take care of you? And lastly, and this last point will be, be quick, worry is a failure to understand divine privilege. The third P. Look at verse 25. This is very interesting. Which of you, being anxious, can add a single cubit to his lifespan? You know what a cubit is. It's a measurement from about the tip of your elbow to the tip of your finger. Turns out it's about 18 inches or so. That's how they measured things back then, was in cubits. He's only using the cubit simply as a metaphor for length. He's not talking about, I'm sorry, he's talking about the length of your life, not your height. And he's simply saying, do you think by worrying you're, that you're going to add to your lifespan? This is a matter of divine privilege. And, and what he says right here reminds me, people know if they spend much time around me, know I'm a bit of a worrier. And they say this to me. I tell them I'm worried about something. And people just say, well, worry about it a little more. It'll make it better. It doesn't work that way. You know, they're, they're, they're giving me this lesson. And, and worrying isn't going to change anything. It's not. You don't have the divine privilege to determine your lifespan, do you? You really don't. Who does? It's God. The Lord gives, the Lord takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. People in our society are infatuated with this. You know, if you just do this or do that, you live longer. Look, this society has kind of gone crazy about lengthening life. We've got billion-dollar industries out there, food supplements and vitamins and exercise and so on and so on. But did you know you can't add one day to your life? Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't really want to be here any longer than God wants me here. When you think about it like that, that's kind of liberating, isn't it? It takes the panic right out. And people are, are just so consumed with their health, and I'm not saying you shouldn't be disciplined. You should. I'm not saying you shouldn't moderate the way you eat and 
and things like that, I, 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 you should and remain in some reasonable condition, but for what purpose? It's so that you can serve the Lord with all your energy. That's what it's for. That's important, but I'm telling you, worry isn't going to lengthen your life because the one that has that privilege to determine when you are born has the privilege to determine when you will die also. So in closing, I want to review with you. Don't worry. You belong to Him. He knows the priority is for you to serve Him. He makes provision so that that priority can be fulfilled. And He determines exactly how long He wants that to go on. To serve Him in our life. May God add his blessing to the reading and studying of his word. Let us pray. Our most gracious heavenly Father, Lord, thank you again for this time that we can come and read your word together, Father, on a difficult topic, one that we don't like to think about because so many of us are guilty of it. Father, we ask that you instill in us a conviction of these truths. Help us to understand how rich these promises are and how wonderful they are for us and how grateful we should be for them. Help us to stop being anxious and worrying and being afraid because we know you will care for us. Help us to trust in you and be rich towards you, putting our treasure in heaven, holding lightly to these earthly things, doing these things with our resources that build your kingdom and showing that your kingdom is where our heart is placed. I thank you for this church and for those hearts that are in, the, in your kingdom. They are certainly here. My Father, I pray that you will bring us back this evening, Father, to again study your word. Be with us on the road of travel. Forgive us when we fall short. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.